Just one verse today, so if you want to open your Bible, you can for the sake of the context. And we're going to look at some other verses in the Old and New Testament. But the message is just based on one verse. Colossians chapter 4, verse 2. Colossians chapter 4, verse 2. It's almost a preacher's dream. Three phrases, three points, and uh, that's it. Devote yourselves to prayer. Be watchful and thankful. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. Aren't you amazed, as we've walked verse by verse through Colossians, how many times Paul emphasizes being thankful? In all circumstances, be thankful. Even in this situation, in prayer, being watchful, be thankful. So as we enter this two-part series, two-part message, part of the series on prayer, I want to say, first of all, everybody prays. I've got a sneaking suspicion even atheists pray. Whenever they're in trouble, if they're in a crisis, when all hell is breaking loose around them, even an atheist probably throws up a prayer in case they might be wrong. I think non-believers pray. Non-believers pray out of desperation. With a hope that something might happen. They're not really sure. But just in case. Let's pray. They pray when they're facing a challenge or a crisis. They want help. And if God's willing to help them. They are happy to receive that help. But we Christians. We Christians know about prayer, don't we? We know the power of God. We know Jesus Christ. We know the provision of God. We know that when we pray, things happen. We know the importance of prayer. So you would think that we would be seeking God and praying more than we do. The sad reality is that we don't. I'm often very disappointed when I look at my own life and see that I don't really pray as I should. What about you? I'm not just talking about praying more in time. Maybe praying with more intensity. Praying with more purpose. There are many reasons we give for not praying as we should. And you know when we're looking for a reason, one reason is good as another. Please listen carefully to this little story, okay? It went down like a lead balloon in the first service, I promise you. (laughs) So I'm hoping for a better response. Story is told of two guys who went fishing Sunday morning. They were having a great time. Until the one guy said to the other, he said, You know what, I'm starting to feel a little bit guilty. Here we are out on a Sunday morning when I'm normally in church. And I'm feeling guilty because I should be in church. His friend said to him, Ah, don't worry about that. I don't feel guilty. In fact, if I wasn't out fishing this morning, I wouldn't be going to church anyway. His guilty friend asked him why. And he replied, Because my wife is sick. (laughs) It's either my storytelling... You see, friend, when we're looking for an excuse, any excuse will do. I mean, we're busy people. We don't have time to pray. Are we busier than Jesus was at the height of his ministry? When he was ministering to thousands of people every day? Yet he found time to pray. In fact, he made time to pray. He didn't create more time. But sometimes before daylight, he would find a quiet place. To pray. Jesus was a man of prayer. The byline of our church, part of the title of this series, More People, More Like Jesus. Why would Jesus need to pray? I mean, you and I have got a lot to pray about, haven't we? We've got sins we need to confess. We have problems in our lives that we're facing. We need wisdom. Why would Jesus need to pray? I mean, Jesus was perfectly perfect. 
He was holy. Yet Jesus had both the desire and the need to pray. He prayed a lot. If Jesus prayed like that, doesn't it tell us that we need to pray? Paul says here, devote yourselves to prayer. So I want to say, first of all, as we look at that first phrase, devote yourself to prayer. Prayer is a priority. Prayer is what connects me to God and with God's provision for my life. And I want to say that also applies to the church. Prayer is not only a priority for me and you, but it's a priority for the church. Jesus said, my house shall be called a house of can I finish what I wanted to say? <laughs> Entertainment? No. My house shall be a house of preaching. Sounds better, doesn't it? Didn't say that. My house will be a house of worship. Didn't say that either. He said, my house shall be a house of prayer. You were right, by the way. <laughs> prayer is so important that it needs to be a priority. James says in the book of James, you have not because you ask not. Now I know that prayer is not just about asking. But I often wonder what I would have today if I'd only asked. That I'm not just thinking about material things. I'm not just thinking about a bigger car or a bigger house. You know, those are the kind of things we tend to think of. No. We often grumble and we complain to God and say, you know, we wanted that to happen or we wanted that to be accomplished. I don't know about you, but I sometimes hear that still small voice of rebuke. God says, why didn't you ask me? You felt that rebuke? I wonder how much we've missed out on because we didn't ask God. We say, you know, God knows all things. He knows everything I think. He knows everything I desire. Why should I have to ask for everything? If you follow that logic, friend, you'll never pray. You'll never pray. God knows everything you want before you ask. But you know what? He wants us to ask. That's prayer. He wants us to ask. That's why Jesus prayed. That's why he taught his disciples to pray. Because prayer, friend, is not informing God of something that he already knows. Prayer is for our sake. For God to do something in our lives that we really need. That's what it is. And I'm not just talking about getting the things that we pray for. I'm talking about... God changing our hearts and minds. That's what prayer does for us. The very act of praying, the very discipline of praying, allows God to work in our lives in ways that He could not do otherwise. Because prayer connects us with Him. Through the process of prayer, we learn how to connect with God. We learn how to hear God's voice. We, know, we learn how to listen. We learn how to respond to God when He speaks to us. We learn how to be more like Jesus as God responds to us when we are praying. He speaks to our hearts. Friends, prayer is for us. It's not for God. It's not to inform God of something that He already knows. It's for us. That's why Jesus said in Luke chapter 11, verse 9, the well-known verses. Jesus said, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds and to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Now it's a very interesting verse. The verbs in there imply persistence. It's a continuation. It says, Ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking. But there's also in those verbs an increasing sincerity of commitment to seeing our prayers answered. It's one thing to ask. 
It's another thing to seek. And it's even more intense to knock until the door is opened. And friend, God honors persistent prayer. Jesus told a parable. Luke chapter 18 verse 1. We read it together. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, in a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about man. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, Grant me justice against my adversary. And for some time he refused. But finally he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God and don't care about men, yet because this widow keeps on bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually wear me out with her coming. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Friends, I want to tell you something about God. He's not unjust. Amen? God is not unjust. As his people come to him persistently, holding their needs before him, don't you think God will be quick to answer those needs? Jesus says, I wonder if God will find that kind of faith on the earth. The kind of faith that keeps on praying. You see, God doesn't always answer our prayers in our time frame, does he? God doesn't always answer our prayers the way we want them answered. And that's why we need to keep on praying. Keep on praying till you get a yes. Keep on praying till you get a no. Devote yourselves to prayer, Paul says. It must be a priority in our life. Secondly, I want to say that prayer is warfare. Yes, our lives need to be filled with prayer because it's like the air that we breathe. When we pray, we're doing the very thing that keeps us alive in Christ. But when we pray, we also engage in spiritual warfare. So Paul says, be watchful. Be watchful. Why? Because there's an enemy. There's an enemy who goes around like a roaring lion seeking to destroy the everything that God is doing. And I want to say this, friend. when we pray, when we pray, we're asking God to do something in the spiritual realm that will enable his spirit to do something here in the visible realm. Let me say that again. When we pray, we're asking God, when we pray properly, should I say, not just gentle Jesus, meek and mild, no. When we pray in the spirit, we're asking God to do something in the spiritual realm that will enable his spirit to do something right here that we can see in the visible realm. Prayer is warfare. We are doing warfare in the unseen realm so that we can see the blessing of God here in the visible realm. That's spiritual warfare. Now, I don't understand this completely. But for some reason, God has tied the accomplishing of his will to his people's willingness to pray. It's a mystery. God has chosen to do that. In Ezekiel chapter 22 verse 30, God's getting ready to destroy the land because of the evil in the land. And we read this in Ezekiel 22 30, God says, I look for a man among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land so that I would not have to destroy it. But I found none. I 
I almost hesitate to say this. But you know, we always need to hold our truths in tension. They're not contradictory, but we hold them in tension. What I want to say this morning is this, friend. Sometimes God's purposes are not accomplished because His people will not pray. You want to stand with God? You want to stand with God and His purposes? You want to call on God to heal the land? And that's the context in the verse that we so often quote when we pray for the country. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sins and heal their land. To say it in a more positive way. Friends, when we pray, God acts. We're going to talk more about that next Sunday. When we pray, God acts. Let me take you to another verse in the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 62, verse 6, verse six and 7. And I'm reading it from the New, a New American Standard for a particular reason. It says there, On your walls, O Jerusalem, I have appointed watchmen. All day and all night they will never keep silent. You who remind the Lord. Can I repeat that? You who remind the Lord, take no rest for yourselves. And give him no rest until he establishes and makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. You who remind the Lord. Remind the Lord of what? Remind him of his promises. Remind him of his goodness. Remind him of his mercy. Remind him of his love for people. Why do I need to remind God of all of that? Surely he doesn't need to be reminded by me. No, he doesn't. But what you're doing, is not, you're not just reminding the Lord, you're reminding yourself. You're remembering who God is. You pray, recount the promises of God. You're reminding yourself of who God is. That's the whole purpose for those of you on the church WhatsApp prayer group. That's the whole purpose of Barry's calling us to pray through the Psalms. What do we do when we pray through the Psalms? We pray God's promises back to Him. What are we doing? We're building our faith in God. And it reminds us, God wants to do something. Amen? God's about to do something. Now that why we need to be watchful, because of the enemy, the enemy comes along, and you know what he tells us? Stop praying. Get up. You're not doing anything. You need to do some work. Get up and do some work. The devil wants us to see prayer as a waste of time. It's not a waste of time, friend. It's the very work that we need to do. Amen? It's the very work that we need to do. It's the very work that will keep us focused on who God is. And you know what? God will answer as prayers. Amen? Devote yourself to prayer. It's a priority. Be watchful. Prayer is spiritual warfare. And thirdly, prayer is praise. Prayer is praise. Be thankful. Amen? Be thankful. Thank God in advance for what God's going to do because He's going to do it. Amen? Praise, personal praise for what God's going to do. Thanksgiving is an expression of our faith in God's goodness. That's why Paul repeats it so often, even in this passage in Colossians. Be thankful. Pray with thanksgiving. For those English literature students among us, Alfred Lord Tennyson put it so well. I know it's a little bit Shakespearean, as I quoted to you. But pay attention to what he said. He said, more things are wrought by prayer 
than this world dreams of. Wherefore, let thy voice rise like a fountain for me night and day. For what are men better than sheep and goats that nourish a blind life within the brain? If knowing God, they lift not hands of prayer, both for themselves and for those who call them friends. Friends, what makes you better than a sheep or a goat? The fact that you know God and as a result of that, you lift your hands in prayer and in praise. Amen. So don't be a goat. Don't be a goat all your life, okay? Be a believer. I know God. I know what God wants me to do. Seek God. Hold your pastors up in prayer. Hold your spouses up in prayer. Hold your children up in prayer. Hold this church up in prayer before God. Amen? Hold the lost people of our community up before God. And don't stop praying until God does everything that He wants to do here. Amen? Don't stop praying and praising until He makes His people, the church, just like we read about Jerusalem, a praise in the earth. That's what God wants to do. He wants to make His people a praise in the earth. And so I pray. I hope you'll join me. May God be glorified in this place. Amen? In this place. May His kingdom come in this place. May His will be done in this place. As it is in heaven. So be it, Lord. <laughs> That's what amen means. When you say amen, you're saying so be it. So be it, Lord. And don't forget, thank you, Lord. In advance for what you're going to do. Amen? Amen. Amen. God bless you. Let's join with the worship team.